Thank you for tuning in to this special episode of the Virginia History Podcast, done in coordination with Commemoration 2019. For more information about Commemoration 2019 and Virginia's 400-year anniversaries being celebrated in 2019, please visit the show notes page for this and other episodes covering 1619's historic firsts. Dr. Warren Billings is one of Virginia's greatest historians. His almost 60-year career in the field began after he graduated with an A.B. in history from William & Mary in 1962. Warren then earned an A.M. from the University of Pittsburgh in 1964, before he followed Dr. Emery G. Evans to Northern Illinois University. Dr. Billings earned his Ph.D. under Dr. Evans' guidance in 1968. Warren's doctoral dissertation, Virginia's Deplored Condition, the Coming of Bacon's Rebellion, 1660 to 1676, signaled what would come from this historian's prolific career. He began a teaching career at the University of New Orleans in 1968, where he has served in assistant, associate, and full professor of history positions ever since. In addition, Dr. Billings has been the chairman of New Orleans University's History Department, as well as their Distinguished Professor of History. Since 2005, Warren has been the Distinguished Professor of History Emeritus at the same institution. Not all of Dr. Billings' work has been solely done at New Orleans University. He has also served as the Visiting Williams Professor of Law at the University of Richmond, as well as the Visiting Professor of Law at the College of William & Mary Law School. Throughout Warren's teaching career, He has produced a spectacular body of historical work, to which I will link in this episode's show notes page. For now, let me point out a few volumes very applicable to 17th century Virginia. The Papers of Sir William Barclay, 1606-1677. The Old Dominion in the 17th Century, A Documentary History of Virginia, 1606-1700. A Little Parliament, The Virginia General Assembly in the 17th Century. Jamestown and the Founding of the Nation. Colonial Virginia, A History and the standard for all things William Barclay, Sir William Barclay, and the forging of colonial Virginia. In addition, Dr. Billings has written numerous articles covering law, archiving, biography, and history, and has featured on many panels as well as lecture series throughout the country. His work has been highly praised, earning many awards and honors, as well as positions within many academic societies. It was my very special pleasure to be able to sit down with Dr. Billings on the 400th anniversary of Virginia's first General Assembly, and discuss this key figure from that 400-year period, Sir William Barclay. Dr. Billings, it's a, it's a great pleasure to meet with you. I've enjoyed your work for quite some time. I use your work extensively in, in the podcast, especially in the current work I'm doing covering Governor Barkley. You wrote the book. I haven't, haven't found anything to supersede that. And on that note, let's go ahead and talk about his importance to Virginia, especially on this amazing day here, the 400th anniversary of the General Assembly. Can you go ahead and summarize the first half of uh, 17th century Virginia situation? Well, you know, it, Virginia, by by the time Barclay arrived at Jamestown, was not what it was intended to be by any stretch of the imagination, you know. And it had undergone several iterations, you know, the, the 1618, the whole, that whole business, and Sands' vision of, of some sort of a commonwealth Right. Was gone when the when the General Virginia Company of London lost its charter, and Virginia was in some ways sort of set adrift. And one of the one of the most you know I think in terms of some of the assemblies, the important assemblies in the course of the 17th century. In the first half, of course, it's 1619 only because it establishes the precedent. I mean, what was 
established in 1619 was not what it was to become. What right. It, and, uh, but the General Assembly of 1624, February 1624, when the company had charter had been dissolved, Virginia effectively was lawless because the company charter was the Virginia's constitution, and that was abolished. Hmm. And to his credit, I think Sir Francis Wyatt, not knowing exactly how this was to come out, called that assembly together and basically said, look, uh, we've got to take some measures to keep some degree of law and order in control. And so it has this assembly that lasts for about two weeks, and it does a number of very important things. One thing, it begins the establishment of lay control over the church. Because Virginia Virginia never beached in any English diocese and harbor from the from the very from the very beginning. I mean, nominally as you know, it was under the the control of Bishop London. Bishop London didn't pay any mind to it and the Archbishop of Canterbury did. So those first church laws, if you look at you know, if you look at those statutes, that's the first thing they deal with. But then they deal with issues that would would drive politics for much of the remainder of the seventeenth century. Defense, food, the economy, some measure of land distribution and management, you know, control how it to send. And also the church, that was, that's the other thing. I mean, you know, they do they do these kind they do these kinds of things. And the first effort at trying to bring some order about all of this happens in 1632 when the first revision of the statutes. I mean, you know, that brings together a lot of stuff, and it represents the first attempts of these people to learn. I mean, that's probably Sir John Harvey's singular accomplishment, and it's one that people don't pay any attention to. He takes a lot of heat. Yeah, and yeah. then for the next decade, you know, the the assembly adds to it, adds to it, and it gets, you know, it gets to be this bloated thing. And Wyatt towards the, I think, you know, Wyatt towards, Sir Francis Wyatt towards the end of his second tenure has in mind some sorts of reforms because, you know, when that assembly was in, was sitting when Barclay arrived in the spring of 1642, they had made some significant addition. And one of Barclay's first political decisions was what to do with that assembly and that thing. So there is that noticeable change. He oh, comes yeah. onto the scene, yeah. and up well, until that point, we've got what you were just outlining. Yeah. And then he comes in and he changes it. And uh, what, what's a little bit of his background? Well, he was from the Somerset branch of the Barclay family. That's an old family that goes back. You know, some of the some of the family legend. Uh, I talked to some of the descendants in in England once, and they. They claim that some of the forebears go all the way back, that they were probably Vikings. The, the Barclay family was one that made good connections with the English monarchs. Barclay's grandfather, uh, grandfather was, had some connections to Henry uh, VIII. And, you know, they lived, in, they lived in Bruton in Somerset. And he was a younger, you know, he was a younger son who didn't have all that many prospects. Uh, yeah, he he apparently went to grammar school. I you know I really mm-hmm. don't know a great deal about his early formal education, except he probably went to there were some grammar schools in where he where he grew up, and then he went up to Oxford for a time, and he you know he he went to Saint Saint Edmund Hall, and he came down, and he went to Middle yeah it was a Middle Temple, his. Mother, by that time, his, his mother had been widowed, and, and she and 
his elder brother, Charles Barclay, who became a lord, and who was close to Charles I and Charles II. They tried to make him uh, become a practicing lawyer, and he didn't want to do that. So he got permission to go abroad, and he made the, you know, he made that. That was the beginning, you know, in the early part of the 17th century, mm. you know, that was the beginnings of the grand tour of the, right. of the the young swells where they figured out what they wanted to do. They went over and stood in the trenches and learned a little in, right. in Holland and learned a little bit about doing uh, soldiering and stuff like that. Sometimes they went to France to learn a good French accent, right. and they all wanted to go to go to Rome, you know, mm-hmm. their passports all said they weren't supposed to go to Rome, mm-hmm. but they went to Rome. And right. I was able to, I was able to, through a friend of mine who was a law librarian at Oxford, find the record of his having been at that, what is it, the English Jesuit mm-hmm. college. Then he came back, and he still didn't quite know what, what to do with himself, but so he did what swells of that sort did. He pulled some strings and got himself made a uh, privy chamberman, which okay. really wasn't a particularly onerous thing. I mean, the value of that was you had proximity. The real plum in all of that was to be the groom of the stool, which, you know, I tell that story when I talk about <laughs> it. He never got to do that, but somebody asked me once what that was. I said, that was the guy who held the chamber <laughs> pot for the king and wiped the king's bum. And I said, right. But the point of those those kinds of household positions was that it was proximity that you could turn into some hmm. something else. And for reasons I don't understand, he, unlike his two brothers, Charles and John, the younger one, who was also ennobled, was ennobled by Charles II, had much more luck in elevating themselves and I mean Barclay was when he made up his mind to leave he was in his 30s he still wasn't married hmm. he didn't have much in the way of property he had some property around where is Barclay Square and he was going to go to Turkey and then he changed his mind he again for reasons that are not altogether clear and right. bought out Sir Francis Wyatt and shows up virtually unannounced in Virginia. You know, he basically does what thousands of other Virginia immigrants did in that period. You right. know, but in a different class. They but were, I mean, yeah. you know, he comes over. I mean, all of them who are successful don't come as servants, but come over with a few servants and buy, get property and work their way up. Or some of them, like Claiborne, who had mercantile origins, all of that. He has the advantage of close connections to the crown. He has some finances. So, and, you know, I mean, and by virtue of the fact that he's governor, he's at the, he's at the apex. Mm-hmm. Everybody's going to come, come up to him. Right. And very early on, he has to figure out how to deal with these right. Virginians. I mean, the people like Claiborne and Matthews. And so so is, he's smarter than both of, most of those people. Right. Certainly, his arrival comes and influences changes. Yeah. What what types of changes are we talking about? Well, the biggest the biggest change, of course, was the division. Of, there are two things that are important in his early year, the first years of the time before he was turned out in 1652, is getting the General Assembly to divide, and having that same assembly revise the laws in force. And I mean, there's some. There's some major things that come about as a result of the revision the laws. One thing was the creation of parish vestries. That was his invention. And okay. the parish vestry becomes sort of the unit of governance that is closest to the people throughout mm-hmm. throughout most of the colonial period. Because everybody has to go to church at everybody least once a week church, and I mean, or once a month. There are all sorts of things that the parish vestries did. I mean, he strengthened the county courts in some ways. And, I mean, there are a whole, there's a whole bunch of stuff in terms of the laws that set, set those things up. You know, shortly after that, just about the time the, the, the new laws went into effect, of course, it was the second, you know, the Anglo-Indian War, 1644-46, where he, he sent back to England to get right. ammunition and weapons. And, I mean, he fights for Charles for a couple of years, but 
it's obvious that by that time he'd already begun, I think, to make his transition from an Englishman who spends time in Virginia to an Englishman for whom Virginia is, is defines what it means to be an Englishman. Mm-hmm. I mean, that process isn't wholly completed by 1644, but the fact is, you know, he could have stayed like his brother John and had a military commission and fought with Charles II, but as soon as he, it becomes clear to him that ain't no help coming from, from the crown, he decides, he gets up what ammunition, you know, what he can buy, and goes back to Virginia, and he mm-hmm. puts, uh, he defeats Opechanko and, and, and all of that, and writes that Indian treaty mm-hmm. into, into the statutes of 1646, you know, which is the basic Indian policy that remains in effect. Mm-hmm. really until after Bacon's Rebellion. And then, of course, by that time, too, actually from the very point when he, most from the time he arrives in Virginia, the English start fighting amongst themselves, and he has to try to keep Virginia loyal to the crown and keep them from killing one another. And I mean, he's fairly successful in in doing that until... 1649, when he gets the notice that Charles has been right. chopped, and that the parliamentary uh, committee, council of state, wants him to surrender, and you know he tells them to bugger off. Right. And right. They don't do anything at first because they've got they're too worried about trying to put down Charles II. And I mean, mm. it's not as you know until they s- smash Charles at the Battle of Wor- Worcester that they finally turn around and they they realize the only way they're going to deal with Virginia is to turn him out. Hmm. And and they you know, they rely on Claiborne and Matthews and a couple of other people and they draw up that fairly large flotilla of ship of naval vessels, transports and, and army soldiers and bring them up here and he, you know, he puts on ever the showman, he puts on this great right. display of of force, and then he surrenders, mm-hmm. and you know Virginia comes under the basically it comes under the rule of the House of Burgesses for the for the duration right. of the period. And, I mean, that's, right, because the next governor is Bennett, Richard yeah, Bennett, yeah. and they elect him. And all those all those all those interregnum governors are weak. They're weak in several senses. They're weak in terms of their abilities, but also their Power. I mean, you know, preachers of the House of Burgesses. And young Samuel Matthews found that out much to his right. uh, chagrin in 1658 when he tried to tried to run run the house out, and they they forced him to uh, they forced that second revision down his throat, and they forced a whole bunch of other stuff down his throat that he had to he had to deal with. Uh, I find it humorous. They still reelected him. Yeah. Oh, they still reelected. <laughs> You're going to stay here, and you're going to do what we tell you. <laughs> well, that's basic. That's basic. I think there's a certain amount of political acumen in that because by doing that, they avoid any problems from London. You mm. know, for the most part, the people in London didn't pay. Once they got the they got Virginia to surrender and impose their sort of vision of polity on Virginia. They pretty much left the place alone, and they didn't know. You know, they didn't. If I think the calculus was. And see, most of the most of those people who served in those assemblies throughout the interregnum were not Puritans. They were all royalists, uh, right? For the most part, I mean, the key figures were all royalists, and they could pretty much dictate who got to be governor, mm-hmm. who not got to be governor, and, mm-hmm. and that sort mm-hmm. of thing. They had a lot of authority for sure. And then, of course, the thing that threw the monkey wrench into the whole business was when. Matthews Jr. died right. unexpectedly because there was no mechanism for a successor when the General Assembly mm-hmm. was out of out of session. And nobody had thought back in 1652 or in 1658 that possibility might exist and how to deal with that eventuality. Sure. And I suspect it was Claiborne and a few other, Richard Bennett and a few other of the councillors who got the idea that, you know, they cocked up that scheme to get somebody to be an acting governor to call the assembly and then have this have the House elect. And they, they got Barclay to, to act. And then they tried to talk him into 
let them elect him governor. And he, I don't think he, I really don't think he wanted to do it at first for a long time. Sure. What, I mean, what was he doing in that time period? Oh, yeah. Well, that's the least known. I mean, part. he just went to Greenspring. And well, he, he went to he went to Greenspring. He experimented. I think he did a lot of his experiments, silk and agricultural mm. diversification. I think that was probably pardon me when he tried raising sugar cane and you know right. all this all this exotic stuff that always appealed to him. My guess is too that he maintained contact with a bunch of the royalists in Holland. Yeah, there, good, there good one, connections. There are one or two hints at hmm. that, that there are only hints I could never, probably so. I mean, if these were these were people who were conspiring, they weren't going to leave much of a paper trail behind. Right, But right. Uh, clearly, he had informants that kept him fully abreast of what was going on in England, mm-hmm. and I think he probably uh, was despairing of the royalists because they could never get their acts together. I mean, they were all pretty damn stupid. And they, hmm. uh, George Downing, you know, who was uh, parliamentarian's uh, chief spy, and he, he, he knew who all those people were. I mean, you, in some of, some of that, there are a few of Downing's papers, not that many of them, that give you some hints into who he knew how he knew, and mm-hmm. of course, he turned his coat as quick as anybody. And, right, and he was very, he was very instrumental to uh, the restoration of the Stuarts and all of that sort of stuff. And so, you know, he agreed to, Barclay agreed to stay in office until such time as the situation was clarified mm-hmm. in, in England. And he all, and you know, it wasn't until what September, sometime in September, sixteen sixty, the chart. You know, he got notice from. The Secretary of State, that Charles already got a new commission and all of that sort of stuff. So then he, you know, he called that assembly into session in October mm-hmm. 1660. And at that point, he can he can begin instituting. Well, and what I shouldn't he, say well, new what government. He, what but. he did see that assembly that he recalled was the one that had elected him in the preceding March, and the agreement was he would not call another assembly until March of 1661, unless there were emergent occasions. And this was, to his mind, an emergent occasion. So he sent out a writ calling all of them back to Jamestown. And there was some opposition to that. I think some of those people who weren't all that keen on his being re-elected were the ones who raised the fuss. They said he should have dissolved the assembly, which he could have done. He He The calculus for him was do I dissolve the assembly? Do I? I gave my word that I would not do that, and do I risk making the situation work? I mean, his situation in 1660 wasn't all that secure because I mean, there, he'd been out right. of office for ten years. A lot of the people that had been his allies were dead or uh, decrepit or feeble or whatever. The other part of it is, I think, as I said, he gave his word, and to him. His word was something that was his bond, and so that assembly did not do it. And again, I think he was reluctant to do mm. a thorough overhaul for, for those reasons. But then the thorough overhaul became a necessity when he found out that there was some possibility of reviving the Virginia Company of London. That's something people miss. And also that Charles had this, had, was surrounded by people who wanted to hedge the colonies into this closed economic system. I don't think Barclay ever understood any of that. And, you know, he was always something of a free trader in the sense that he thought people should trade wherever they wanted. And, and right. He had connections with the Dutch and that sort of stuff, and he was he was not keen on all of that. And he also had that position on the Council for Trade and Plantations. That gave him an opportunity, you know, so he talked himself into becoming the 
agent for the colony, and they sent him to England, and he spent um, the better part of a year, you know, lobbying against the navigation system. You know, he, he did an elaborate effort, lobbying effort, but that just wasn't that just wasn't to be. And I mean, mm -hmm. um, he got out of Charles the permission to try to diversify the economy, raise some taxes, and all this sort of stuff. I mean, basically, Charles sent him back to Virginia to do pretty much what he jolly well pleased. His diversification schemes, like Robert Beverly said, he, he had more than he had time and energy to. But the, the fascinating part about it is he came about that close from really, pull, from really pulling it off. Right. But I mean, all sorts of things worked against him. The wars with the Dutch, the problems right. with the natives, on the problems with the servants. As the decade of the 60s wore on, he just began to lose it. I mean, you know, he was he was very ill sometime in the oh the sixteen sixty six sixty seven. Nobody knows exactly mm -hmm. what it was. And of course, he got he became deaf. So he creates a number of enemies at that point in yeah, time he while created, he's losing. He it, creates right? people who doubted him. They were all afraid of him. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, to say that they were none of them really wanted to show their and they want, on one hand, they sucked up to him to get whatever they could in terms of position. They talked behind his back all the time. Mm -hmm. they, they were fearful. And they, they, also, they also wondered, you know, they, he had had such a record of success as governor. I mean, you know, he was a, he was a very good governor in lots of ways in right. terms of how he manipulated the General Assembly, how mm -hmm. he, he made things, he made a variety of things happen. Sure. Uh, but... He, as I say, by by the late 60s, by, you know, 1669 and 70, around the time he married Dame Frances, he was pretty feeble. Hmm. And what had been once a very acute politician, his acuity had just sort of disappeared and he, miss, he made serious missteps, mm -hmm. that, I mean, particularly with the coming of uh, the Indian attacks. And, well, also, you know, the, the thing that I think at the end of the day, the thing that really tore it was less the Indian attacks, although those were important, but the uh, attempt to kill the Arlington Culpeper Grant, you know, and they raised, right. raised taxes, a huge, a huge amount of taxes, and sent that lobby over there. Again, almost worked, but both mm -hmm. the Bacon's Rebellion and... I mean, the rebellion is, I think, is basically a case of two very stubborn individuals with very sharp disagreements over what, mm -hmm. what to do. So you would argue it was those two things, the Arlington Culpepper yeah, yeah. as think, well as Bacon? I think ultimately those are the things that really set off. He just cocked up the whole prosecution of, I mean, you know, if it hadn't been for Robert Beverly, he probably would have been run off and... And the crown, you know, the crown saw that as a, I want to say, I want to say golden opportunity, but an unexpected opportunity. Because by that point, by the, by 1672, 73, 74, particularly after the Third Anglo-Dutch War, and you know the burning of the tobacco fleet, and the failure of that fort at Old Point Comfort, which Barclay said would never work, but they built it anyway. People in people in London, his people in the, on the Privy Council, his brothers were gone, some of the other people who had been close to him were gone, in exile. and there were these younger members of the Privy Council, they didn't, have, they didn't have any investment in him, most of them weren't even alive, uh, and so when this rebellion, the news of this rebellion, now's the time for us to, to strike at Virginia, to bring Virginia more nearly in line, I mean, you know, it's part of that whole shift in approach to how the, the English wanted to govern colonies after Bacon's Rebellion, you know, when, when the navigation system really begins to take, I mean, it, when it really becomes a system. And of course, then he goes, he goes back to England thoroughly disgraced, and nobody wanted to, nobody wanted to deal with him. And, uh, you know, the contrast between that and when he went back in 62, when, you know, everybody wanted to talk to him, and, the king included. The king would barely see him. You know, the, 
he never had his last audience. And so, so essentially, everything shifts. He's got the issues there at home. Yeah. That that second term essentially ends in disgrace. He is recalled to England. Yeah. Yet there's still an impact that he left on Virginia and then oh, yeah. later in the United States. Oh, yeah. uh, what, what would you say those oh, impacts I mean, were? You know, he's one of the earliest major colonial administrators. Of course, he was Virginia's longest serving governor. He, Which that won't change unless they change the law here. It's one term, four years, you're yeah, done. Yeah. <laughs> he transformed Virginia in lots of ways. I mean, you know, the, the idea of the great country house. He saw he was one of the people he introduced. And I think he is, as I say at the conclusion of that book, he is one of those people you could use as sort of a metaphor for what it means, you know, what does it mean to be a colonist? What do you you know, what happens? How do you make the transition from whatever you were to an Englishman who defines his Englishness as living in, in Virginia. That part of his existence is no different from thousands of unnamed and uh, nameless people. But he's certainly instrumental in beginning that change. I mean, he yeah, comes into a, a struggling settlement, and when he leaves, it's not struggling anymore. It's, no, it's not. It's really not. It's struggling, but not, not for existence. Right. I mean, you know, it really ceases to struggle for its existence. Mm-hmm. Probably about around the time he, he arrives, and in the 1640s. I mean, hmm. I would, by that point, Virginia was what it was going to be. It was just going to enlarge and become, in some ways, more sophisticated. So, a tremendous impact for, oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. What recommendations do you have for those wanting to learn more about 17th century Virginia and William Barclay as, as well? Well, they want to learn about Barclay, they can read. Uh, right, your book that. is, yeah. But also, if you want to learn, there's a general history of Virginia. Which you probably know, uh, Colonial Virginia history that I wrote with John Selby and Thad. Yes. That's, mm. uh, you might want to read a little Parliament. You might want to read John Cooper's dissertation published. I mean, that. Send me an email and I will. Okay. I will. Well, one place, one place you can look too. Do you know the, the modern edition, the most recent edition? of the old meaning in the 17th mm-hmm. century. The bibliography is in there. They're tremendous. So, I mean, those are, yeah. uh, I mean, they're somewhat out of date. I, mm-hmm. I can I can sort of update you on okay. things that have sure, and come I'll, out since then. I'll put it together on a show notes page and, okay. and certainly do that. Yeah, I'm uh, going back on Saturday, so I, okay. I will be, you know, I will be available sure. Monday or something like that, right. the first part of next week. Uh, All right. Well, Dr. Billings, I appreciate you taking the time here on such an important day, uh, celebrating the 400th anniversary. Thank you again for supporting the podcast. It's greatly appreciated. Please continue to spread the word and help this colony to keep growing. Start by following us on your favorite podcast provider, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and visit the website. Sharing episodes and other work is the best way to expand the community. Another way to greatly aid the podcast is by providing feedback on iTunes. If you have yet to do so, please take a few minutes and leave us a comment. Doing so helps bring exposure in the iTunes network. It also helps me to know what I need to improve on in future episodes. If you would like to support the work financially, please consider supporting the podcast on Patreon. Links can be found on the website, or one can visit the campaign at patreon.com forward slash vahispod to see the choices and rewards being offered for your generosity. And please, join me next time as we continue walking through Virginia's history. Lost day.
Bad do do bad, do 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 do